Mountain and Madge Lake are very beautiful. Not only on warm summer days, And in the evening, but during the colorful days of autumn, when beaches are deserted and there is a touch of frost at night, except for a few late wild asters, the wildflowers have faded and we look for beauty in the trees and wild fruit. Winter, too, has its own special beauty. For those of us accustomed to the noise and bustle of the city, a Christmas spent in the park is a very different experience. It is truly a time of peace. Most of us are summer visitors. If so, these introductory slides, ending now with these three pictures taken in springtime, may help us get a different view of Duck Mountain Park. It's always beautiful. Spring is nature's busiest season. It's the hurry-up time. Watch this example. Smilax, commonly known as carrion flower, goes through a phenomenal growth spurt. This plant, which we watched all through the growing season, grew to two and a half meters from ground level in five weeks. Notice the blue bottle flies near the top of the picture. This plant prefers to be pollinated by them and attracts them with a bait they can't resist, a smell of carrion or rotting meat. Individual flowers are minute, but they grow in ball-shaped clusters. This slide shows one cluster shortly after pollination when the flowers have faded. Tiny berries develop and as summer progresses, these berries grow bigger and fatter and begin to ripen in early August until they form a tight cluster of blue-black berries with a bloom or powdery surface. The carrion flower is one of many plants that prefer to live near the edge of the forest. Here are a few more. This is a sprig of high bush cranberries and the unusual flowers from which they develop. The large white outer flowers are sterile, purely ornamental. The small, creamy ones do all the work. Pin cherry blossom is very attractive. Hawthorn is a handsome bush too. It produces brilliant red berries, that is, when the blossoms are not frozen by late frost. As long as we are on the edge of the forest, let's have a look at some of the flowers that live in the forest. The easiest way to find them is by taking a slow walk on the nature trails. I'm more familiar with the Red Squirrel Trail, but all the trails are well worth visiting. This is the kidney-shaped violet, a tiny one named for the shape of the leaf. You may find it in mossy ground near a stream. Marsh marigold provides a blaze of cheerful color in dark, wet corners. The northern bog violet is very rich when you see it through a magnifying glass. Notice the contrasting, converging lines leading toward the throat of the flower. They guide the pollinating bee to the nectar. In the process, the bee deposits pollen from another violet on the stigma and is showered with fresh pollen during his visit. The lovely yellow lady slipper seems to be making a comeback. It was near extinction from being picked and dug up. There are a few small ones on the nature trails. The yellow lady slipper is an orchid, one of several we can enjoy in Duck Mountain Park. The round leaf orchid is a little gem. It hides under the horsetails and you would never notice its beauty if you didn't get down on your hands and knees and look closely. This one reminds us of an alien pilot in his convertible spacecraft. There are at least five wintergreens in the park. 
Here are three of them. Greenish flowered wintergreen. One flowered wintergreen is only eight centimeters tall. Getting a camera under this one is lots of fun. If pink is your color, then you have to love the striking little pink wintergreen. Labrador tea blooms too early for midsummer visitors. When you see it, be thankful and use a magnifying glass and enjoy it more. Rattlesnake plantain is another orchid found on the Red Squirrel Trail in early July. It is named for the bold pattern on the leaves at the base of the stem, resembling snakeskin. But by the time the flower is open, the leaves are faded and hard to see in the forest undergrowth. Arctic or stemless raspberry. In 30 odd years of visiting Duck Mountain, we had seen this bright flower only once. Its flowering season is short and we always somehow missed it. But a tip from the park nature officer in June of 92 sent us hurrying along the nature trail. We found a healthy cluster of these lovely flowers in full bloom. This military looking flower is Marsh Skullcap, a member of the mint family with hairy square stems. It has opposite pairs of leaves standing at attention and pairs of cartoon-like flowers. It looks like a drill squad or synchronized swimmers. Here's another twin, the star flower, often found in among the round leaf orchids we looked at a few moments ago. Harebells adorn ditches and pasture from June to August. This strange looking flower, the Indian pipe, has no green stuff, no chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the green substance in plants that makes it possible for them, using the energy of sunlight, to convert simple minerals from the soil into sugars and then into complex tissues. This plant bypasses all that and has the ability to use the products of decaying vegetation directly. Some years it's quite plentiful. Sometimes it doesn't show up at all. It's a most unusual flower. Joe Pieweed likes wet places too. This picture was taken beside a pond just west from Madge Lake, but you can find it much more easily beside a stream on the Red Squirrel Trail. It's big and colorful enough to hold its own against any garden flower. Wild Columbine. I'd like to find it again. This one was on an old nature trail that was swallowed up by expansion of the campground at Pickrow Point. Grape Fern, one of the more unusual plants on the trails at Madge Lake. Thick leafed mint. This one is very common. If you squeeze the leaves, you can smell the mint. Tea made from the leaves alone or with lavender, rosemary and bergamot is pleasant on hot days and a remedy for upset stomach and nausea. Here's the mint again. And this is what I mean by looking closely, especially with a magnifying glass. The nature trail is a guided tour but many forest flowers grow around the campground and the cottages. This flower, the Western Canada Violet, is the most abundant of all our violets, and it blooms all summer long. Notice the stripes, they guide the bee right to the nectar. Unless you come in May, you are unlikely to see the delicate fairy bells hidden under the leaves, but the fruit the berries rise above the leaves and are quite conspicuous. They are among the most colorful berries in the forest and taller than most of the ground cover. These waxy looking berries, both the white ones and the red ones, should be avoided. Children should be warned they are not edible and may be poisonous. They are called Bane berries, plentiful, 
and easy to recognize. The plant is 30 to 40 centimeters tall. The berries are quite glossy. Two-leaf Solomon seal becomes a regular carpet if it's left undisturbed. This single flower photographed many years ago has become a sizable patch. The berries were once cooked and eaten by Indians. Striped coral root is another plant that's hard to miss in early June. Every park visitor has seen this one. They call it tall lungwort. In May and June, and sometimes much later, it's plentiful in the park. Stop sometime and look closely. The little bells are shaded all the way from blue to pink. By the way, you might prefer the botanical name in this case, Mertensia. Now very few visitors see these. You really have to get down to see the flower of the nodding trillium hiding under the three leaves. But if you get down and in close, it's certainly worth looking at. Trillium roots were used to make an eye wash. The seed is often dispersed by ants, which carry the pods some distance from the plant to eat an oil-rich appendage while leaving the seed itself intact. Bunchberry, flat against the ground and in large clusters, it's quite a sight. So are the bright red shiny berries. There is no chance of mistaking them for the poisonous bane berries. These berries are on a stem only a few centimeters tall and the plant leaves are oval with distinct parallel lines where the much taller baneberry has leaves that resemble maple leaves with sawtooth edges. Among the edible berries of the forest are swamp red currant, wild black currant. Can you see it there? I think the birds got there before I did. Low bush cranberry. I got to this one just in time too. High bush cranberry, the kind we pick for jelly and cranberry ketchup. There are many more edible berries in the forest, but let's get back to the wildflowers. The largest wild orchid in the park is the showy lady slipper. About the size of a tulip, it is rare in Saskatchewan. It is so lovely, there is a temptation to own it by picking or transplanting. Either way, the plant is destroyed and no one gets to see it again. It would be nice if your grandchildren and mine could see and enjoy this lovely flower. There are many plants that choose to grow in or near water. Here are just a few of the more obvious ones. This one is the yellow pond lily, the one most of us know simply as the water lily. Then there's smart weed, water calla, resembling a small Easter lily, arrowhead, yellow water crowfoot, familiar in roadside ponds, Tway blade, another delicate orchid, barely eight to ten, ten to ten centimeters tall. It grows in water-saturated places and swamps. Pussy willow likes the wetter soil beside lakes and sloughs. When the pollen is ready, the colors are often quite remarkable. This odd-looking flower is the reproductive stage of horsetail. It likes wet places. Once the spores are released, this part of the plant dies while the separate green horsetail continues to grow. Mealy primrose, another scarce one we should resist picking. Northern grass of Parnassus. Don't ask me where that name came from. The familiar cattails flourish in every roadside damp spot. Just about every part <clears throat> of the plant has served in the past for household use or as a food. Leaves, stems, roots, flowers and pollen 
all have been put to good use. Nowadays, we still like to keep the brown seed heads and stems in a vase for decoration. Altogether, a remarkable plant. This one is Northern Gentian, which closes up tight every evening. And then there's the lovely fringed gentian, another lakeshore flower, which blooms in August. And that was a fair sampling of park wildflowers growing near water. But the place to find most wildflowers is the roadside ditch. Unfortunately, most of the time we drive by at a hundred kilometers an hour and ignore them. But look at what we miss. Here is the early blue violet in all its glory. The humble but lovely field chickweed. Twining honeysuckle that uses whatever it can reach for support. This one is using the rough bark of a tree for a foothold. In close, it is an unusual and a colorful flower. Goat's beard with its huge head of seeds that travel for miles on the wind. Here's a little flower that, despite its diminutive size and pale green color, and the fact that it grows in deep forest shade, manages to stand out quite distinctly. It's called Bishop's Cap. The finely divided petals give it the appearance of a pinwheel. This is blue lettuce, a summer flower similar to the asters. Most years, it is quite prolific in Duck Mountain Park. Smooth catchfly, an odd looking flower with subtle coloring. Hoary pacoon, a bright June flower. Many Saskatchewan folk call it cowslip, as it reminded our pioneers of a spring flower that brightened European pastures. Yarrow is one of our most familiar flowers. Wild pea vine, a beautiful roadside flower that blooms in June and July. In favorable seasons, campers can see a large clump of it at the roadside near the campground office. It's worth a closer look. Strawberry blight, the flowers look like little strawberries. This plant shows up in clay in the season after excavation. Wild strawberry. The fruit is small and it makes tedious picking, but marvelous eating. This one is spotted touch me not. It grows in wet ditches and roadsides. It's easy to recognize the flowers hanging like little elf's caps, yellow with bright red spots. It forms small pods which curl and twist when touched, breaking open to shed the seed. Canada anemone, often five centimeters across, appears singly or in great roadside masses. Close up, it's quite handsome. Fleabane, one of many beautiful daisy type flowers. Linley's aster blooms in August and until frost cuts it down. Lindley's Aster, here's a closer look. Northern Bed Straw is very plentiful in the ditches in June and early July. Several kinds of goldenrod follow each other in quick succession. This one is called Stiff Goldenrod. This one with a conical shape is likely Canada Goldenrod. The lovely morning glory shows up in August. There are several clovers in the park. This purple clover is one of the most colorful. Getting closer makes it look even more showy. Spreading dogbane, just another roadside bush. Up close is quite pretty. Honey from the flowers of this plant is much relished. Bumblebees, or butterflies with a long proboscis have no trouble taking nectar, but smaller, weaker insects often are trapped at the entrance to the nectary and they die there. 
spreading dogbane and a close relative Indian hemp were important to Indian tribes as a source of fiber from which they made fishing lines and nets. Golden Corridalis, only a few centimeters tall, grows in sandy wasteland or at the dry edge of a beach. It has to be tough as it's often trampled. Here's another tough one, fireweed, the first flower to appear out of blackened soil after a forest fire, a beauty surrounded by devastation. It starts the long process of soil renewal by adding humus to the blackened earth. This was a fireweed too, ready to open, but the hungry fellow you see here devoured it bud by bud. Here is the handsome flower called giant hyssop. Meadow blazing star in August is the showiest flower in the pasture. There's beauty among the grasses too, if you take time to look. This one is blue-eyed grass. This one is foxtail grass, painting a rainbow with early morning dew. Too bad the wild roses don't last very long. Three different roses are very common. This one is the prickly rose with deep color and sweet perfume. Here it is again, a lovely flower. These are the hips of the woods rose. Indian paintbrush is another very attractive plant. In the season when this picture was made, the colors were more vibrant than usual. Cow parsnip often grows up to three meters tall. This flat-topped plant with very broad leaves and stout hollow stem is unique and quite harmless. However, there are at least two poisonous plants that to a child's eyes resemble the cow parsnip, so the best advice to youngsters is leave it alone. This roadside beauty is the yellow evening primrose, which blooms in August. Each stem has a long spike of flowers which open starting at the bottom for only a day or two. This way, the fertile period can be as long as three weeks. Let's have a closer look. Campers at Madge Lake pass several of these handsome plants between the campground office and the highway. The western red lily grows in Duck Mountain Park, though not in the profusion you see here. Single blooms are not hard to find. Such a lovely flower is Saskatchewan's floral emblem. It has been picked almost into extinction. Please, please don't. Leave them for others and their children to see. They seem to be making a comeback. Outside the park, we may see doubles, triples, whole bunches, and once, would you believe in a downpour of rain, we found 19 flowers crowded on four stems. Take time to walk, to stop, and to look, but leave the wildflowers where God planted them for others to share. That's what I'm going to do now because that's the end of our little show. Thank you very much. <laughs>